down right now, the entire site. Hello, everybody. Speaking of websites being down, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm told that YouTube is down right now, but I don't care. When it's up, maybe we'll be the first thing people see. And ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the American Sci-Fi Classics track. And we're doing an early episode, a bonus episode, if you will, uh, where we're going to talk about superhero movies with an expert, a classic track irregular, one internet away from me, Mr. Keith DeCandido. How are you, sir? Hello. I am well. Um as well as can be expected, you know, given the current apocalypse, but, uh, but doing, doing good, uh, plugging away at things and, and, and always happy to talk about superhero movies, having, uh, written quite a bit about them over the last three years. So, um, yeah. And, um, we, we'll, we'll let you tell us more about that. But first, uh, secondly, I would like to end, I need to introduce my unindicted co-conspirator, Mr. Gary Mitchell. How are you? I am well, everybody. Uh, I have new glasses, which is why you're seeing uh, a shine that you don't normally see. And I got those new fancy blue block ones, which apparently puts mm. a nice coating on there. But now it's like, I, no matter how I turn my head, my lens, my, my screen is reflected. <laughs> <laughs> Technology is like a bit sometimes. I like yes. it. So what was... Yeah. Let, let's go all the way back. What was the first live action, like theatrical superhero movie y'all saw? Uh, in the theater? Yeah. It would have to have been um, the Christopher Reeve Superman. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I saw, I mean, I, the first one I would have seen would have been the Batman movie, but I saw that on television. Yeah. Because um, mm. I wasn't alive yet when it came out. That's true. Um, but uh, in fact, in fact, I love this, this, part of the story. Um, I saw Superman uh, in a movie theater with my aunt and mm. we saw it in Hackensack, New Jersey. <laughs> and we get <laughs> to the part where we find out where Lex Luthor diverted the second missile and he said, Hackensack, New Jersey, and everybody in the theater just lost it. <laughs> and then when Superman saved the Hack and tag from the second missile and saved Miss Tess Tessmacher's mother, as well as everyone in the movie theater. We all cheered. Far louder, I'm sure, than anybody else cheered at that particular. Time. That is so great. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, I think Superman one was mine too, uh, but um, I have more of a memory of seeing Superman two. Mm. Although I'm positive, I saw them both at the same place in our little dinky hometown. But Superman two, for some reason, I uh, what I had a I, I remember having like a, the flu or whatever you had in Alabama in the early '80s. It was something rotten, and um, I was I was sick for weeks, and my mom bought me a recording that she had made off the radio of like an NPR interview, a preview of Superman two. So I just listened to that thing over and over again while I was recovering from the sickness. And then my uncle, who was a super geek who got me into everything. Uh, he uh, took me to see Superman two. Once I recovered from the Alabama craziness, whatever it was, I don't know that I've fully recovered from it, but um, Superman 2, I have more of a memory of. Uh, but uh, th those, even 3 and 4, there's still good parts because it's Christopher Reeve, in my opinion. But we'll get to that. Uh, Gary, what about what about, uh, what about you? Uh, my stepfather was a cheapskate who didn't believe in going to the movies. Uh, mm -hmm. So... The first one I think I got to see in the theater was Superman 3. Mm. I saw the others when they came to HBO. Right. Yeah. So, you know, it was caught up. <laughs> yeah. It, I it, when it should be pointed it. out that, that the, the earliest, in terms of what you could see, in terms of feature length things you could have seen in the theater, there were only two other options prior to, to Superman, which are Superman versus the Mole Men in, uh, in the 50s, and then uh, the Adam West Batman in '66. So yeah, I mean, that uh, was the, I mean, you could have seen movie serials. You could have seen there were the 
the Superman movie serials with Kirk Allen, the uh, the Batman movie serials with Robert Lowry and the other guy. Um, I can't remember his name now. For the other one who played Batman was in the in the, the Batman one. There was the Captain Marvel one. Um, you can make an argument for Flash Gordon <laughs> and Buck <laughs> Rogers. Yeah. Um, uh, but so, and there was a Captain America movie serial where where his secret identity was a district attorney. What? Not named Steve Rogers. Um, yeah. What? Yeah. All right. But so uh, illuminate now, everybody, Keith, on how you come yeah. by this encyclopedic knowledge of mm -hmm. all things superhero films. Well, part it, it, part of it was just being a nerd for you know fifty one years, but uh, it 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 became solidified in twenty seventeen. Uh, I had just finished. I've, I've been writing for Tor.com, which is an award-winning webzine, uh, popular culture uh, website. Uh, I've been doing rewatches of various TV shows, mostly Star Trek, as well as Batman sixty six uh, and the Stargate uh, uh, TV shows and movies. And I was finishing up uh, both Batman uh, sixty six and the original Star Trek. I'd already done. Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and then I was finishing up the original series, and I wanted to do something else, and I was I was Star Trek'd out at that point, um, <laughs> and and I did eventually move on to Voyager, which I'm doing now for them. But oh. uh, at the time, I was like, I want to do something different, and it, and it occurred to me what a cool thing to do, given how many of them there are and how popular they are, is to do um, a complete rewatch of every single live action movie based on a superhero comic book. Um. I limited it to that. I, I stretched the definition of superhero a, a few times, um, and I didn't want to get into the animated ones because then that that there's no way I'd be able to find all of them. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was it was easier to to stick with just live action, you know, feature length stuff. Uh, and it took me three years uh, before I caught up to real time, <laughs> uh, three and a half mm -hmm. actually, because um, I started. August, oh. I started in August of 2017. For the 20th century ones, I, I doubled, sometimes tripled, or even quadrupled up. Uh, and then once I hit uh, X-Men in 2000, basically all the 21st century films, I did one per entry. Sure. Because uh, those are in more recent memory. Um, and it's and again, yeah, I went from August 2017 until January of this year when I finally caught up to real time and did uh, Joker. And um, since then, I've, I'm going to revive the feature every six months to a year or so. Uh, in June, I covered uh, Bloodshot and Birds of Prey, uh, as well as Faust, which I missed the first time through. Uh, ah. I'm not perfect. Sorry. Um, but And then the end of this year, I'll cover at least New Mutants and The Old Guard. Um, right. And theoretically, Wonder Woman 84, although I'm, 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 not, I'm taking the under on whether or not it actually gets released on Christmas Day, like I said. <laughs> yeah. well, um, <laughs> everything else has been postponed to next year. So. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Now, what were your rules? Like, is there anything you would not cover or you were like, well, this is borderline, but I'll cover it anyway? It had to be based on a comic book first, um, okay. which left out a few things that, that some people thought I should cover, like uh, Buck Rogers. Mm -hmm. uh, Buck Rogers actually got his start as a prose story. The comic book was based on a, on a couple of novellas. Um, so that, that uh, The Shadow also was not based. That, that started out as radio. Uh, on radio. I'm guessing. Um, same thing with Lone Ranger. Now, um, did you stick with comic books or what about newspaper series? I did. I did comic strips also. So I did. Okay. Dick, I did all the. I did not only the Warren Beatty, Dick Tracy, but also the Dick Tracy uh, films that were released. There were four of them released in the 1940s. Ooh. Um, which are which were fascinating. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I, I won't go so far as to say they were good, uh, although I won't go so far as to say they're bad either. They were. They were. Um, they were interesting. <laughs> and um, and I and I so it had it had to be it didn't have to be a theatrical release it just had to be feature length basically mm. or theatrical release so yeah, yeah. Dick Tracy so like so it, like TV guess. movies then TV movies were were fair game so and pi like certain pilots for TV shows I also covered if they were if they were feature length so I didn't do the uh, Adrian Pelicky Wonder Woman because that was only one hour ah uh, but I did do. The two Incredible Hulk movies they did in the seventies, nice. uh, the the Spider Man movie that kicked off that show, the the failed Doctor Strange pilot, um, the 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 god awful Justice League of America pilot from nineteen ninety seven, the Generation X pilot from nineteen ninety five, Nick Fury. I did. Well, that was a, that was a TV movie. That wasn't a pilot. Yeah. That was. Uh, but I did. I did cover yes the Hoff 
as as Nick Fury, Agent of Shield. I actually paired that one up with Howard the Duck. Nice. <laughs> which which actually was a really good pairing. That was yeah. that was a fun pairing because both of them were released at the worst possible time. The Howard the Duck was very much a product of the seventies. The comic book was originally uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. very much. It was it was you know wacky, crazy. There was a villain named Doctor Bong. Um, mm -hmm. You know Howard the Duck ran for president, and yeah. and, and it was just completely zany. In a way that that only really could have happened between the years of in the seventies, it was well between nineteen seventy two and 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 nineteen eighty one more or less that mm. that whole that period there. It was released in the eighties, and it was very much an eighties movie, and it really didn't work. All of the sleaze, all of the grit, all of the interesting stuff was take was drained out of it. Yeah, it was just basically a, a rehash of of E. T. You know. Mm -hmm. um, actually, it's interesting. If you watch E.T., Howard the Duck, and Mac and Me, they're all the same plot. All right, Gary, get on that. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't make anybody watch Mac and Me a second time. That's just that. Oh, that, my that, God. That, we did it. Uh, but, but they all, it's the same basic plot. You know, visitor yeah. from elsewhere, winds up on Earth, has adventures. And there's even a all three of them have a big chase of some sort involving some sort of vehicle, whether it's a bicycle or an arc light or whatever. Um, you know, and and there's and there's well, ET doesn't have a musical number, but both Mac and me and Howard the Duck do. Oh, um, yes. <laughs> and Mac and me ends with that threat of we'll make another one. <laughs> no! But uh, so so Howard the Duck was basically I said it was, it was released in the eighties, which was the worst time to do a Howard the Duck film because it completely contravened the point of it. By the same token, the worst time to do a Nick Fury Agent of Shield movie is between the fall of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the Twin Towers. This was a yeah. time when espionage stories were of no interest to anybody. <laughs> um, uh, you know, Nick Fury was very much actually what, one of the things I love about Nick Fury, and I think why the the that character endured for so long, is he was a, a wonderful combination of the '60s secret agent with mm -hmm. um, the gruff old World War II veteran. Yeah, two completely different subgenres that they mushed together. That that uh, that Stan Stan Lee and, and the gang. Uh, mushed together and it, and it worked beautifully. It was it was just it was a nice variation because he was a, he was different from the usual gentleman spy that you were seeing all over the mm -hmm. place at mm -hmm. the time. Um, yeah, he's yeah, a spy that's going to punch you in the face. Yeah, doing a Nick Fury movie in 1998 wasn't really great timing. <laughs> <laughs> no. Plus, it was terrible. But mm -hmm. um, uh, but yeah, I did cover that and uh. I covered, you know, the Swamp Thing movies and and mm. uh, the, obviously the the the, the Tim Burton and, and Joel Schumacher Batman films, um, the Christopher Reeve Superman films, and then you know and and all all the TV movies from the seventies and eighties, uh, and and theatrical releases. There was Supergirl. There was the two Wonder. There was the failed Wonder Woman pilot and the successful Wonder Woman pilot. Yeah, yeah, the one with uh, Crosby, Kathy Lee Crosby, which was actually better than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, I rewatched it myself um, yeah. a few years ago. R Ricardo Montalban is in it. Yes, and they hide his face for seventy five percent of the movie, as if you can't tell from that voice who it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like who is the mystery villain? Clearly, mm -hmm. it's Mister Rourke. Yeah. And, then, and yes, <laughs> yeah. Who knew that Fantasy Island and Themyscira were the same island? Yeah, <laughs> or these sister islands. Indeed. Uh, but the thing is, Wonder Woman was actually that that Wonder Woman, the, the Kathleen Crosby, was the perfectly serviceable. Action adventure spy spy type movie, it just wasn't really Wonder Woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But but it actually wasn't like I said, it wasn't that bad. Uh, and Crosby was great. She actually did a really mm -hmm. good job in the role. I particularly mm -hmm. liked the way she basically deflected every attempt that the men around her made to flirt with her, <laughs> uh, which was something Linda Carter did really well too. Um, you know, I mean, basically every man around her was a complete and total sleaze because the seventies. But uh, but she. She handled it all elegantly with a plum, with a minimum of fuss, and without being, you know, mean. Um, and and we just got a question on Facebook that that I have to answer. Which would you rather have seen, James Cameron's Spider Man or Tim Burton's Third Batman with Marlon Wayans as Robin? Yeah, pop that up there, the Joe. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm. By the way, that is from Tom Morris. Tom, remember to let Streamyard know your name. Yes, because you're just a Facebook user. You are an anonymous person on the internet. You are a user. 
which we don't we don't believe in anonymous people in the You see, he's a refugee from the Tron movie at this point. Gotcha. Okay. Um, th to to provide a little background here, James Cameron uh, was one of the 974 people uh, who tried to do a Spider-Man film between when Stan Lee moved out to Hollywood in 1981 and uh, 2002, when the Sam Raimi film finally happened. Um, it it was at the time one of the problems with with a lot of the um, the 20th century Marvel uh, projects was that Marvel wasn't that fussy about who they sold the film rights to. Uh, yes. Um, mm -hmm. Roger Corman's got cash. Yeah. Um, well, look, whatever you guys want to do is fine. Yes. Uh, and and including check several, clear. <laughs> yeah, right. Including several companies that went out of business. Um, including Canon Films. Uh, but for there was a period there where James Cameron was attached to it, and actually some of his script did wind up in the 2002 film. Yeah, really? the organic yeah. web shooters were his, right? I think that was him. Yeah, and there were some other there were some other elements. He 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 agreed to he was he approved them using it without giving him credit. Um, hmm. They had to they had to ask his permission. Um, and and there was one other treatment uh, that was floating around that they they cribbed elements from as well. Um, that all got mushed together into David Kep's script, but um, I would have I would have been really interested to see Cameron's Spider Man. Yes, um, Burton's third Batman with Marlon Wayans as Robin could have been interesting. I have no objection to Marlon Wayans as Robin. Certainly, hmm. I know a lot of people at the time did, but um, couldn't have been any worse than you know Jamie Foxx's Electro, but um, or <laughs> or or for that matter, Chris O'Donnell as Robin, who was frankly terrible. Um, then again, I'm still waiting for evidence that Chris O'Donnell can act. So, mm. I, um, you're going to be waiting a while. I yeah. think. I mean, but um, but I think I think um, I mean uh, Burton's Burton's sensibilities on Batman were interesting, and it was and, and it was an interesting take. I uh, the biggest problem with those films is that that he's obviously more interested in the villains than he is in the hero. Oh sure. Um. But, but having said that, given how incredibly dreadful Batman Forever was and how uh, soul-suckingly horrendous Batman and Robin was, uh, yes, I would have rather seen Tim Burton. <laughs> yeah. um, Wasn't Leo because the Cameron film? Hmm. The Cameron film, yes, it would have been nice to get it, but we actually got three, well, one good Spider-Man film. <laughs> Two and a half. Eh. Yeah. I, I love I love how they did Octopus. Okay, I I am going to die on this hill alone and unloved, but mm -hmm. I do not like Spider Man. I I and I know this is that 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 I am in the minority in this, and and and, <laughs> but I just I never I don't like the I don't like that version of Doctor Octopus. I think the version in the comic book mm -hmm. is more interesting. Um, I think creating a wife for him just to then fridge her and ignore her was pointless. Um, the whole sequence uh, with the train with him being in a mosh pit all of a sudden on a train was just ridiculous. Plus, trains don't end like that. <laughs> Look, we're not all from New York. Up, so exactly that sort of thing won't happen. <laughs> um, and, and, and there were a lot, there were a bunch of logicals. And I mean, Alfred Molina was great. He's always mm -hmm. great. Um, yeah, it, it's not his fault. No, not at all. Right. And, 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 uh, and I like the fact uh, there were, there are elements of those good. And, and I like the way Tobey Maguire played Peter Parker. Mm -hmm. Spider-Man didn't do anything for me, but his Peter Parker was excellent. Um, it's actually the exact opposite problem I had with Andrew Garfield. I thought Andrew Garfield was a perfectly was a good Spider-Man, but I, his Peter Parker was a skateboarding doofus. Yeah, um, that was yeah, there was a wonderful if you could have merged the two of them because yeah. my biggest problem with the Raimi Spider-Mans is Spider-Man's mouth should always be running. Mm -hmm. He should be talking constantly. That's one of his biggest superpowers. Is he annoys everybody. Right. Exactly. And, and they and they so they can't fight him because they're too busy going. I'm gonna get my hands, and and spy and Gar and uh, Raimi Spider Man does not chat. Yeah, <laughs> and now they fix that. I think with Tom Holland. Oh hell yeah! Oh yeah! He, you know you're not supposed to talk, right? <laughs> <laughs> like even uh, in 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 Civil War when yeah. he is irritating the other Avengers. Right. Yes. No. That's Pete. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The the yeah Holland Holland. The funny thing is though, what, what especially funny watching fun watching the Spider Man the Raimi films is that um, Toby Maguire is very much Steve Ditko's Spider Man, mm. and Andrew Garfield is very much John Romita Senior Spider Man. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in a lot of ways, and and um, crap, I blanked on her name. The 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 actor who played Gwen Stacy. Bra, Bryce oh. Dallas Howard. No, not the, the, no, no, Emma. Oh, Emma. Emma, Emma Stone. Stone. Thank Emma you, Stone. Emma Stone. Uh, looked like John Romita drew her onto the celluloid. Mm-hmm. It was just, it yeah. was amazing. Um, so. As somebody who watched superheroes from the dawn of film to to yes. now, do you think that the biggest one of the biggest hurdles for superhero movies up until the eighties, nineties was the budget and trying to do superhero effects? That was part of it, certainly. Um, but I don't, I don't think that. I mean, they they made it work. I mean, the 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 George Reeves Superman was a huge success. Um, and and their, those special effects were, were were laughable, but they made it work. Um, I think the the biggest hurdle was that the filmmakers didn't take the source material seriously. They, as far as they were concerned, this was kitty fair that they were they were sprucing up by putting it on film. Mm-hmm. Um, the I mean, even 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 the sixty six Batman was predicated on not taking it seriously. To be fair, what he had to go on was the Dick Sprang comics of the 1950s, which also weren't taking themselves seriously. So, you know, it was true to the source material in that sense. But um, at least the, the source material that William Dozier was familiar with when, when he created the show. But um, but I think the reason, and I think the main reason why the 21st century versions have been so much better received and, 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 and generally just better films is that you now have filmmakers who grew up reading these comic books, who did not think... Right. Of- Kitty Fair, who, who are actual fans of it, um, who who take the material seriously on its own terms. The I mean, Kenneth Johnson very famously thought that comic books were stupid, um, <laughs> and and was freely admitted that he thought the Hulk was dumb. But he he thought he, it was interesting to him in terms of the Jekyll and Hyde conundrum. Mm-hmm. Um, so he played with that, but he pretty much threw out any, everything else from the comic book, up uh, yeah. the main character's name, but. <laughs> Indeed, I um, all I wanted, I believe, uh, when I was a youth, after starting in comic books, when when uh, Christopher Reeve, uh, when that movie came out, and when the Incredible Hulk TV series came on, I thought, all I want is this. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all I want is more, and and Wonder Woman too, yeah, and the Batman reruns. Uh, all I want is more of this, and now I got it. Mm-hmm. And um, but it was a long road getting here. Uh, I remember after the Batman movie, Batman eighty nine, <laughs> and everybody thought, well, now we're going to get all these. And you know, Starlog would have all the upcoming movies in the back of every issue. They would say, we're going to get all these superhero movies now. And it mm-hmm. took us an entire year. We had to wait for the next summer, and what we got was Dick Tracy, and that was it. <laughs> that was all. And then we had to wait. I, I'm, I, I may be off in the timeline, but we had to wait, I believe, another year until we got Rocketeer. That was not, Yeah, that was 91. Yeah, we got Rocketeer. We got the Phantom. We got the Shadow. It, it, to be, you know, from the, the, the aftermath of Batman. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I also remember, you know, it, you know, being in the fandom at the time. It's funny that you mentioned Keith. The, you know, now we're taking it seriously. <laughs> I remember that was a lot of people of talking about, you know, when Batman eighty nine. It's like at last, finally, the the stench of Batman sixty six is gone, and we're taking it seriously now. And now, when I watch the Batman eighty nine movie, I still love it, but it's goofy. Oh yeah. It's it, incredibly as goofy. goofy. As... The, 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 there's a scene that's ripped off from Batman 66 when, when Joker's defacing the art gallery. That's right out of the um, uh, the one where Joker decides he's going to be an art, a pop artist now. You know? mm-hmm. so, and yeah. I mean, it's, it's Jack Nicholson in clown makeup. What yeah. were they expecting? <laughs> what was going to happen? It's Jack Nicholson, and they said, be crazy. Yeah. yeah. And he said, and- I can do that. Yeah, but, but it felt like it took years for people to see the silly side of it because everybody was like, oh, it's so grim and so dark and so serious. It's like, yeah. did we see the same movie? <laughs> well, it was more grim and dark and serious than, you know, and plus yeah, they, had, well, they were comparing yeah, the architecture on, 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 on speed that, that Burton loved so much. Mm. Um, but uh, so, and that, that had something to do with it. Um, 
but yeah, and I'm just I'm just looking at the the list of the the other stuff I did that that came out in the '90s. Um, we've also got uh, Judge Dredd, mm. the, the Sylvester Stallone one, uh, Barb Wire, Tank Girl. Excuse me. Um, it actually was the same year as as Batman, but The Punisher. Um, mm-hmm. Top Wonder, yeah. And um, and there were also the attempts at doing Captain America and the Fantastic Four, which were never released, and the world was grateful for that. Um, oh, and, and as uh, Tony Ann uh, reminds us, the Tur- Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, yes. which yes, 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 yeah. a fantastic comic book adaptation. Okay, when when that movie came out in 1990, which was the year I graduated college, um, I was stunned because I thought no one will ever top this because, you know, at the time it was a believable thing. No, this was the most faithful adaptation of a comic book. Right, that I had ever seen. It matched the comic book perfectly. They didn't change anything of mm-hmm. at all. Um, uh, it was it was it was remarkable. Um, and it and you know it 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 owed yeah you know, the success. Batman was nobody expected Batman to be quite the success it was. I mean, I remember the summer of '89. Everybody was walking around with a with a bat on their T-shirt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and 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 it led to a lot of things. Uh, David Schum in in the chat just mentioned the Flash TV series, which was also mm. uh, a direct result. That's, of, yeah, yeah. Of Batman's popularity. You know, the Turtles getting greenlit, Dick Tracy, and then all those other. You know, all, suddenly everybody was like going to comic book companies and saying, "Hey, what what can we do? What you got? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where can, how can we make some of this Bat money? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and and Dark Horse in particular really jumped to try. You know, you had. Barbed wire. You had uh, Tank Girl and and um, the mask. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, the um, we did a whole panel uh, about this at Dragon right. Congo yeah. Virtual, where we talked about uh, the Shadow and and um, other other um, other things of their ilk. But so, if you want to wait until this is over and then <laughs> go and and watch us talk more yeah. about that. That yeah, was the influence of Batman on the movies. Yeah. yeah. So kind of breaking away from that topic then, since we've already covered it. Um, More of each decade, which would you say was the most either successful as an adaptation or a successful uh, movie uh, of the, like the forties, the fifties, the sixties. Um, well, I mean, but prior, prior to the seventies, there's not, there's, there's not much from each. I mean, the, the fifties really only had, Superman and Moment, which was actually a really good film, mm. uh, really good uh, sort of uh, Frankenstein uh, pastiche uh, involving you know these creatures who lived underground, uh, and uh, and 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 you know Superman basically you know saving them and and learning what they are rather than just assuming they're monsters, um, which which was which was a really you know good good message good Superman story, mm. uh, you know not perfect but but it was it was very well done. Um, you know, the sixties you really only had the Adam West Batman, which is, is absolutely a classic. Oh my gosh! It, it, in particular, what I love about it is the satire. The Batman sixty six didn't do sat- straight up satire that often. They mostly just stuck with Goofy. But when mm-hmm. they did do satire, they did it really well. And and both the that wonderful bit where where the the Navy Admiral belatedly realizes that selling a surplus sub to somebody using an obvious pseudonym in a PO box maybe isn't a good idea. <laughs> um, and and the whole thing with the with the United Nations uh, substitute at the end, uh, the World Council or whatever the hell it was called, um, where where they all had their brains switched was just a wonderful little bit mm-hmm. of political commentary there. Um, in the seventies, it's a tough choice between uh, Christopher Reeve's Superman um, and and the Incredible Hulk. Mm. Um. I mean, partly because I mean, the Incredible Hulk, the Christopher Reeve Superman felt like he had stepped right off. Like, like, like what I said about Emma Stone before applies to Christopher Reeve too. He looks like Kurt Swan drew him on the on the side. Indeed. And, uh, the thing is that that was also the the first two Superman movies were also a victim of people not taking the material entirely seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, the actors took it seriously, uh, and and Reeve's earnestness is a lot of what sells the movie yeah uh, you really i mean I, looking at it now 40 years later i don't necessarily believe that a man can fly but i do believe that he's superman 
you know, I and 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 for that matter, I believe that he can disguise himself with a pair of glasses because he didn't just take he glasses off. Totally he, did it. Yeah, he changed his whole posture and body language and everything. It's brilliant. Um, but the 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 Hulk really did a good job of using the setup of the Hulk. I mean, it was basically the fugitive, except he turned the Hulk, into a yeah. monster. But it worked, um, and it worked. It it it, adapt, it was a good adaptation of the story of the Incredible Hulk to a TV show that could be made at the time, and still felt like the Hulk. Yeah, but worked within the cons, the, the budgetary and the special effects constraints of the time. Because they could have done like those plots could have and were on mm -hmm. every other detective oh, yeah. show. It yeah, was, uh, it, it in was, the seventies and it was kung fu. It was yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was about to say almost ninety percent of TV in the seventies and eighties was the A team, or it was person goes to town, fixes problem, goes to next town. Right. Or or yeah. or alias person, Smith and person, Jones. Person mm -hmm. works for heretofore fictional government agency in a team that only has like three people in it, yeah. uh, <laughs> and, and goes out and has adventures. That's what MacGyver was. That's what Wonder Woman was. That's what yeah. uh, Mission Carol Impossible. Was. Um. For that matter, the Red Brown Captain America films were, mm -hmm. were the exact same. Yeah. Um, in the eighties, um, not, there's not as much to work with in the eighties. Yeah, what happened? You're not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean that you know because the, the the Superman sequels uh, were not all that in a bag of chips. Uh, the Punisher movie was terrible. I mean, I have to be almost the Tim Burton Batman almost by default. Yeah, you had to wait till eighty nine to get there. Yeah, yeah, uh, and then with the nineties, the the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles definitely is in the discussion. Mm -hmm. um, the mask is certainly in the discussion. Um, what about Blade? Bl oh yeah, Blade. Blade. Blade works. I think Blade is another one like The Incredible Hulk, where they change a lot of the source material, but the changes they made made it work as a movie. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I wonder, in a lot of time, a lot of these movies, I think starting with Superman the movie, mm -hmm. they, in a lot of ways, improved on the source material. Some of it. Um, I don't know. It wasn't even necessarily improvement, but the, the changes they made made sense for the medium. Yeah, th yeah, that is true. Because in the Superman comics, up until Christopher Reeve, and really for years after, it was just one-off issues, uh, with wacky villains and Lois trying to figure out his secret identity, mm -hmm. and that 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 took up forty years of comics yeah. until. And how can movie. Superman cleverly stop them without just running, flying up and punching somebody in the face? Yeah, and, and and also the ridiculous contortions he would go to to preserve his secret identity for no good reason. Yeah, yeah. and that was the fifties, the sixties, and the seventies. And then they did the movie, and they 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 realized the movie makers realized there's a story here with Superman and Lois, mm -hmm. and and then um, Superman comics got better or mm -hmm. different. They got different. Yeah. After that point. Yeah. The, Michael um, Bailey, where are you when we need you? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, yeah, yeah. He knows things. Yeah. Um, but I also want to give I want to give a, a special mention for the '90s to the um, Mystery Men. Mm. Mystery Men, one of my favorite things. Yes, it's it's only it's not a perfect adaptation of the Flaming Carrot comics team that that it was based on. Um, it took a lot of liberties with it, but it really worked. That was a movie that came out about 15 years too soon. Yeah, um, yeah. because the world was. Parodies of genres really work best when the genre it's parodying is popular. Um, and superhero movies weren't really going to be a thing yet for another year because um, it came out in 99. Mm -hmm. X-Men didn't come out until 2000. Um, like Deadpool came out at the perfect time. Deadpool was when everybody was ready for a exactly. superhero parody. Exactly. Um, and uh, Mystery Men would have been, and it was such a good movie. It is. I, you know, we've got a date with destiny, and she just ordered the lobster. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favorite things. Yeah. That's it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I love I love Mystery Men, and really, I, I think I feel the same way as you do. Also about Watchmen. The Came Watchmen. out too early. Mm. I feel like. <laughs> That oh, wasn't, yeah. To my mind, that wasn't the problem with Watchmen, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> the problems. <laughs> well, I, the biggest problem 
Okay, my pro- Watchmen actually, I think, was the best possible Watchmen movie you could have made. Mm-hmm. The problem is making it as a movie. The yeah. when you're when you're adapting a longer work into a shorter work, which is what you're always doing when you're adopting uh, a literary work into a movie, you're mm-hmm. distilling it down. You know, you're mm-hmm. you're taking. A friend of mine used to refer to it as finding the short story inside the novel, and that's what that's what the movie is. <laughs> um, yeah. Because well, you have to you have to cut out. The, the character bits, the little historical grace notes, the little extra bells and whistles and things, and just boil it down to the plot. Here's the problem. What's cool about Watchmen is the character bits, the little historical grace notes, the bits and pieces on the side. The actual plot is dumber than a box of hair. <laughs> and the movie... And then they took that out. Huh? <laughs> and then they took that out, the ending. They well, took it, 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 yes and no. I mean, it was, it was a variation on the same... It was, yeah. Yeah, it was just it was just a different version of of, of a dumb supervillain plot, um, mm-hmm. and and either way, whether whether they had kept the the fake alien monster that teleports into New York uh, or not, it still was basically a ridiculous plot, yeah. and that's not what's cool about Watchmen. And Snyder tried his best to include as much of the of the comic as he could have, but it was just overstuffed, and you like you lost track of characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the whole, the whole first third of the movie is about the comedian, and the comedian is completely irrelevant to the rest of the film. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And 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 it's unfortunate because it was it was perfectly cast uh, for the most part. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, especially Jeffrey Dean Morgan and Jackie Earl Haley and uh, Billy Crudup all mm-hmm. nailed their roles perfectly. Um, they were just superb, um, and it's. It's disappointing that because really the best the best format for Watchmen would be like a miniseries. Do it as, an HBO miniseries, say about well, eight episodes. <laughs> that wasn't what I was thinking, although that was fucking brilliant. Um, the the and and the, the that was that was also a great way to do it. And, and that, I don't I don't think that ever has been done before, where somebody did a TV show or a movie that was actually a sequel to a comic book like that. Yeah, yeah, um, exactly. And they didn't try to explain to you. Hey everybody! Here's all the things from the comic book that you should know. It was like we're just going to start. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it worked. Yeah. And, <laughs> and there was a discussion. I think it was on your Facebook, Keith, where we were talking about this very thing, where the difference is between distillation versus condensing. Yes, I've mentioned that a bunch of times in in the rewatch. Um, that yeah, the 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 best adaptations are the ones that. Like you said, it uh, it distills fifty odd years of comic books into a single story, and yeah. the ones that don't work are the ones that compress. Um, that was my issue with um, uh, Spider Man Three, mm. was that it it compressed the origin of Venom. Uh, not to mention uh, Harry Osborn's entire character arc, yeah, uh, into one film. You know, Harry Osborn went. All the stuff that happened to him in Spider-Man Three was stuff that in the comics happened over the course of about twenty-five years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're gonna yeah. speed run this. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah so we gotta get this in. Yeah, Venom's origin is already just the biggest convoluted mess. Uh, yeah, it's like that... first we have to do Secret Wars. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I was so curious as to how they were going to get Venom into the Spider-Man Three movie, and then it was just boop. Okay, here he is. Yeah, yeah. they they cribbed the animated series. Well, the animated yeah. series did it. The, the sort of. I mean, yeah. the animated series did the. Well, it's from space. Yeah, no, and that, and and what what the animated series did, and what Spider-Man Three did, was at least a more streamlined version of it. Mm-hmm. Um, which which, you know the the. The creation of Venom was so haphazard and, and, and you know, developed over, you know, sort of, uh, not, not developed, that's just it. It just sort of, this thing happened and then this thing happened and then they decided to take that all and mush it together. And, hey, look, here's Venom. Um, well, I, yeah. I still remember the quote from McFarlane when they asked him about why he drew Venom with that mouth like that. And he said, because I didn't know there was a person in there. <laughs> <laughs> he thought it was just the blobby alien thing. No one bothered to tell the artist working on the book that. Oh, by the way, Eddie Brock's inside this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. For the because well, for the first couple issues, we didn't know who it was. That's mm-hmm. true. It was just this mysterious creature in the last couple pages of like the two or three issues leading up to Amazing Spider-Man 300, which introduced him more formally. Um, 
And it was also, a, also the big slavering mouth is a good way to distinguish him from Spider-Man in the black costume. Right. You know, I mean, that, so that, that much at least, uh, worked, but, um, uh, Anyway, to, to go back to our little decade thing, two, the 2000s is tough because that mm-hmm. you've got a lot of options. Yeah. Um, starting with X-Men. Um, mm-hmm. And X-Men is a perfect example of the distillation theory because there is no hit comic book history more convoluted than that of the X-Men. Mm-hmm. Indeed. And God damn me if, if Brian Singer and, and his screenwriters did not manage to do it beautifully. Hour um, and a half. Yeah. Hour and 45 minutes, yeah. whatever it you, was. You knew everything you needed to know about the X-Men there. Part of it helped that he, he cut the cast down, which was smart, mm-hmm. and and used both Logan and Rogue as point of view characters who are being introduced to this, so they get to find things out with the audience. Yeah. Um, which also helped. But um, but it really it just perfectly set everything up. And then the future movies were able to build on that and do more more recognizable X-Men stories. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Because again, that was another X Men is another one case where the, the plot was dumber than a box of hammers, but um, but you didn't care because you know yeah it was like ooh Wolverine in live action yeah and it worked yeah and it was uh, cool but, <laughs> yeah and 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 you and you can't mention the two thousands without mentioning Iron Man because that right. started an empire, um mm. and and successfully um mm-hmm. and um. But I honestly, I, I would have to probably give it to what I think is one of the best superhero movies ever done, which is The Dark Knight. Mm. Um, okay. And and I specify The Dark Knight rather than Batman Begins or The Dark Knight Rises, both of which I think are horribly flawed. Um, Batman Begins, I saw that movie already when Mask of the Phantasm came out in 1993. Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and Love it, that movie. Yeah. And and Mask of the Phantasm is actually better in pretty much every measurable sense than, than Batman Begins was. Um, but, uh, having said that, um, and the dark Knight rises about Batman who quits and I'm out. Yeah. And, and, and I had a bunch of other problems with it as well. Plus, you know, Hey, let's take this Latino, uh, bad guy and cast him with a British person. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, whitewashing Bane was not, I mean, both times they did Bane, they screwed it up. The first time they made him into an a thug in the, yeah, yeah he was just a, a brainless thug in, in Batman and Robin. And then they whitewashed him in, in, the Dark Knight, which was ridiculous on both ends, um, mm-hmm. but the Dark Knight itself is is a phenomenal movie. Um, you know, it, it, because it's not really a bat. It's not really about Batman. It's about or about the Joker or about Two Face. It's about Gotham City. Yes, it is very much about this city and what is happening to the city. Um, in the same way that The Wire is about Baltimore and the way Bosch is about Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, uh, mm-hmm. this is. The, the place was what was most important there, and it really did a wonderful job. Of yeah. One of the most powerful scenes in film is still when the big uh, guy, w- prisoner, walks up to the guard and says, give me the control, and I'll do what you people should have done 15 minutes ago. And he throws it and, the yeah. 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 Beautiful and, scene. And, 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 and one of the things that pissed me off about The Dark Knight Rises is that it went against that by having the citizens of Gotham City basically sit around on their thumbs for months while Bane took over. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> they they captured all the police in the subway. Yeah, I don't know how they did that. Yeah, but police work three shifts. Where where you're telling me all three shifts went into the subway, and then they <laughs> lived down there for they months with no bathrooms. Guns have bullets with gunpowder in them. There's not one MacGyver among the cops who can build a bomb out of that. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, but even taking it as, you know, if you were just to make it about, you know, rich ninja, but the Dark Knight still works yeah. as a is a film as well as a superhero film. Um and, and getting into the 2010s, then it gets really hard. <laughs> um I honestly I gotta go with the Avengers on that one. Yeah, I think uh, I agree. Yeah, uh, the the whole idea. Uh, I mean, it's funny because you know so many people have tried to redo what Marvel has done successfully and failed at it. Mm. Um, but the Avengers perfect it, it perfectly worked as the next Captain America movie, the next Iron Man movie, the next Hulk movie, the next Thor movie, um, and kind of the first Shield movie. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And it also worked as an Avengers movie. 
Yeah. Um, it it so many different things, and that's a hard balancing act to do because Age of Ultron did not manage it. Um, Indeed. Age, uh, Age of Ultron was a little too overstuffed with too many things going on, and 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 it didn't it it dropped it dropped several of the balls it was trying to juggle. Age um, of Ultron to me, it did juggle them. With, yeah, with Age of Ultron to me was like the Spider Man three of the Avengers. It was sort of like they and, and they but they skipped the Spider Man two. It was mm. like, it was like they said, look, you have to put these things in this movie. And yeah, I think that's probably the biggest problem because with the Avengers was it was the capstone. It's like everything we've been doing has built to this. Yes. And then they did it. They pulled it off. Yeah. That scene at the end where we get the camera pan around the Avengers in the mm. middle of New York was a fight. Honestly, yeah. that's kind of the end of the movie. The rest, the the next like forty minutes is basically the MCU doing a victory lap. <laughs> <laughs> but well, we did it. Plus, you also have uh, um, the Hulk throwing Loki back and forth on the floor. Which is oh god, yeah. yes, yeah, yeah. Which, which had that beautiful callback in Ragnarok. But, yeah. <laughs> but the the that was that perfectly encapsulated what what Kevin Feige and the gang were doing with Marvel and 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 it just everything worked in that movie and and the the fact that they pulled it off is still remarkable mm -hmm. um, and it still holds up as as a strong movie as uh, and it and it set the tone for the rest of what has been the most successful series of movies in the history of the world yeah so, yeah is but there it, uh, like well, go ahead Gary. No, I was going to say, it. one of the things I like about It and X-Men both are they both are team movies. Yeah. The X-Men movie could have easily been Wolverine and his buddies. Yes. Uh, and the Avengers. That's what they are. But. Yeah. And the Avengers could have easily fractured under bringing all these different characters together. And both the fact that they didn't, that it did hold together, and the fact that you didn't really have to have seen the other movies. It helped. Yeah. But you it, it still managed to be cohesive without is like that's one of the things I think we going forward is the big danger of the MCU is like how tight are we into continuity now? Hmm. Into their own continuity, yeah. Right. They've made it work so far. I mean, in, I mean, Infinity War and Endgame did really rely on on the previous movies, but none of the others have. I, I mm -hmm. think uh and, and they've done a really good job so far of you know keeping keeping the movies in and of themselves as as stories with a beginning, a middle, and an end, with mm -hmm. bits and pieces that tie into the larger thing, but that aren't necessary. Yeah. And most of those are specifically stuck in the in the after credit scene, which which has its own set of rules. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, but um, the movie itself is usually tends to work on its own. Um, but it's but it, and even with that, you know, you can't you can't mention the twenty tens without mentioning so many of the others. Um, you know, there've been some phenomenal uh movies uh, and some terrible ones but you've you've got black panther you've got uh, mm. Captain marvel um yeah and 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 so many other you know little movies that actually did a very nice job of of adapting their source material one one i want to mention because it's actually not that great a movie but it's probably the most faithful adaptation and, and, and along the same lines as teenage mutant ninja turtles was are the two Sin City movies? Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. Um, the uh, first one is especially the first one. Yeah. Actually, that was that was what I was attempting to get to mm -hmm. was are there movies that people sleep on that kind of passed by and and nobody really focused gave them the uh, comic book adaptations that nobody really laser focused on and I think Sin City is definitely right there. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 got all the same flaws the comic book has. Mm -hmm. But it's very faithfully. I mean, that is Frank Miller's stuff in cinematic form. Now, Sin City is very yeah. cinematic anyway. The comic book, is, yeah, which helps. Yeah. Uh, Rodriguez basically used the comics as a storyboard. Um, yeah, and and it was perfectly cast. I mean, you know, uh, Mickey Rourke and Bruce Willis and Michael Madsen were all basically born to play Frank Miller characters. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and Powers Booth, for that matter. I mean, they created oh. they created a whole story for his character for for the for the sequel. Um, but uh, now, well, I was, I, but uh, to to answer Joe's uh, other question, there's there was one other, there's a couple of others that that um, did a nice job um, that that people don't necessarily remember. Uh, Red, mm. uh, 
not so much the sequel, but uh, but Red itself. Red, the, the original miniseries by Warren Ellis and Cully Hammer was much more stream. It was just the first, I don't know, uh, 20 minutes or so of the movie. That's the comic. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I read the comic after I saw the movie. Yeah. Thinking, oh, yay, the comic is going to be hilarious. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, the comic is excellent. I mean, it's just really... Well, it's Warren Ellis. Warren Ellis so. character and yeah. Mary Louise Parker character, and that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but it's it's a phenomenal little story. And then the filmmakers took it and ran with it. Um, and and the, the final product still obviously has that as its springboard. Um, yeah, but the, the yeah. movie with Malkovich and... Yeah. Mm. Thumbs and, up all around. And, and, and Richard Dreyfuss being incredibly evil. Yes. <laughs> Uh, what about the movies that people don't know are comic book based, like A History of Violence or um, the Tom Hanks uh, Road to Perdition? Right. I, di I didn't cover those in, in the rewatch because it was specifically a superhero. Okay. okay. So I didn't do History of Violence. I didn't do Road to Perdition. I didn't do um, American Splendor. Mm. Um, I didn't do. Uh, uh, there was another one, um, something confidential. I can't remember the. Oh yeah, and something yeah, uh, and it's gone. But yeah, yeah. Ghost World, yes, Ryan, Ghost, Ghost World. World, yeah, um, and uh, and a bunch of others. The uh, so I, I didn't really cover those, and I and I haven't seen all of them either. <laughs> there it is, and Tony Ann is like, what a history. Yeah, exactly. Right there. Um, that's yep, yes. yep, it is. Um, the. Uh, uh, where then, do you uh, oh, go ahead? No, oh, go ahead. I was done. What as as you were pointing out, um, everybody now is going to try to copy the, and they have attempted to copy the Marvel model of uh, building, building the thing a universe and then exploring the thing. But they like with the the first Justice League movie, or at least the cut we've seen so far, they try to do it all in one movie. Well, the, one of the reasons why the MCU worked is that they took five movies to build it. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, Iron Man came out, the Hulk came out, the Hulk had a cameo by Tony Stark in it, and that was it. Yeah. It was some like bits and pieces in the opening credits where they're mentioned S.H.I.E.L.D. in a couple of yeah, uh, our, yeah. But it wasn't overdone. You know, Thor wasn't really, was only related insofar as um, uh, Clark Gregg was in, was in the movie. That was right. right. That and just Shield in general was the only real solid connection with the other two. Um, they kept it low key though. Um, ah, I see what you did. Yeah. Oh, oh, no, no, Gary, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. Um, I wish I wish I had meant to do that. I'm sorry. Um, and then Captain America again. It, you had Stark's father, um, but again, they kept it. They kept it. You know, simple and not all that complicated, and didn't start. You know, the connective tissue. Uh oh, uh oh, Keith's been grabbed by Hydra. <laughs> nice. Give him a second. Uh, yeah, Ryan. For, uh, I can never say that word, but yeah, that was a very good movie. Persepolis. Yeah. Persepolis? I have not seen this movie. What? Uh... What's going on with that? Um, it's an animated film based on a comic from... Oh, now I'm going to... Iran. A, a, late, a girl growing up in Iran in Austria during the Islamic Revolution. It's a oh. really intense little story. Oh, Keith's computer crashed, apparently. Oh, no. Bummer. Well, so um, maybe let's. Okay, Keith is on his way back, but in the meantime, uh, Gary. I feel like we should mention the Crow from the '90s. That's my favorite, one of my favorites from the era. Hey, that thanks, we didn't mention. Gary. I appreciate that. Oh, you're well, welcome. You're talking about the movie. I, um, as a, it, it's nice to have a movie with your name in it. And much like the crow in that movie, I am a grim specter of vengeance. Yeah. I, um, the soundtrack. Oh, the soundtrack. 
that you, you can't you, you can't get away from how great that soundtrack is and I wish the crow movie would be remembered more than for the death of the star yeah that's that is so tragic mm-hmm. yeah because it's I, we could talk for a whole hour about the lost potential of Brandon Lee. Yeah, yeah, we 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 got to do a. We did a we did a crow panel. Mm-hmm. We did, and I was not on it. Why? 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 I was probably doing twelve other. Panels. You were you were lurking in the back in the shadows. Yes, <laughs> yes. While that while Henry Rollins played, exactly. Um, but but uh, no no we 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 there there there's tons there. Mm-hmm. Um, I they did a crow sequel. No, was, they didn't. No. Uh, thank you. But we there were there were no sequels to the crow. Shane Ivy, my <laughs> I remember this. Yes, tell the story. Conspirator uh, from Revolution SF, the game designer, Art Dream Games. Uh, me and Shane went to at DragonCon a premiere of that movie, and the director it was the Crow Three, wasn't it? The Crow Three. And the director was sitting in front of us. <laughs> yeah. And me and Shane did not know that. And we were not merciful in our discussion of the movie. And then at some point during the movie, during the watching of the movie, a boom mic drops into the shot. This is the finished version oh, of God. the movie. And then the director goes, oh, we're, we're, we're going to take that out. <laughs> and that was like halfway through the movie mm. and um to go and see the movie that night at dragon con we had to leave the convention and walk through the post-apocalypse dystopian hellscape of late night in atlanta not where the hard rock cafe is so mm-hmm. there were no people chain link fences it was a nightmare, <laughs> and we lived. We didn't die, uh, and we got to see the Crow Three. And I still remember running into you and him because they played it like three times over the mm-hmm. weekend. And I ran into you and and Shane, and I was like, "Oh, and that new Crow movie is playing. I'm thinking about going over there." And you were like, "You both were like, no, no." We're like, shut that down. <laughs> <laughs> just just don't <laughs> just don't but the um uh what one thing i was going to well let, let's i want to continue with the thing i was going to ask and we we started talking about it with Keith what's a superhero movie that people sleep on they don't really think of uh and we've talked about it on other panels um uh we um what's a everybody knows iron man the avengers everybody says those are their favorites what's one uh besides the crow um that nobody thinks about like people overlook and i think uh blade 2 the first blade also mm. but blade and blade 2 are crazy good yes and um and tony ann uh Constantine, yes. also pretty dead gum good. Mm-hmm. It, it's go ahead. No, it it is as good a Constantine as I thought we would ever get. Mm-hmm. And then the new guy who plays him on TV is just that's Constantine. Uh, but the movie itself, if they took the Constantine name off of it, it'd still be a good movie. Yeah, it would still be a very, very fun, mystic, detective, horror kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because he's very much not Constantine. Uh, his attitude is close. Yeah. But, you know, he needs to be British. I can deal with him not being blonde. But, you know, it was just, it it didn't quite. But I love the devil in that movie. That and, was um, the ancient one. She was not. She didn't play the. Devil. No, she was the. She was Gabriel. She was great too. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Um. The guy from Bush. Mm. He was not the devil either, was he? No, he was not. He was a devil, but he was not the devil. Okay. He, but- he's, he's the European German guy. I can never remember his British. name. But- yeah. Um. 
Yeah, and uh, John Drew throughout Sky High, which Peter is not Stormare. based on a comic, but it's a wonderful superhero movie. It's one of my favorites. Peter Stormare, thank you. Um, one of our commenters, uh, Peter Stormare, that was the devil in Constantine. Nice. Why well, I, I was going through that, I was going to get to him eventually. I was going to yeah. go through the entire cast. Uh, Joe, keep an eye out. He's Keith's trying to come back in. I'm watching closely. Um, but was Scott but, yeah, Scott High High was, no, it, it was an original property, which is why I don't think it would have counted it in would, his in his rewatch. Oh, that is Keith. Hi, Keith. Keith. Hello. Um, Keith will be joining us from the comment section for the rest of the recording. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we banished him to the comment section. Yeah, but Sky High was great fun, and you know Bruce Campbell is amazing. I love the storyline with uh, uh, the the sidekicks, and uh, and my one of my favorite bits is um, oh Keith's growling. That can't be good. No. Um, no. I mean, it was just a fun movie. Is there a movie now? We're talking about adaptations in this panel specifically, but as Tony mentioned, uh, Sky High is fantastic. Are there, whenever they do superhero movies and it's not based on an existing property, I always go, Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Really? And I don't know why. I've all, I'm, I'm a very gatekeepery about my superhero. <laughs> <laughs> when, when they make them into live action stuff, like when they do a, a big movie, I go, well, A, why didn't you just license insert character here for this story? Or the opposite way, I, I, I think, why hasn't a comic book ever done this story? Like, for example, um, I, I think the movie Hancock with Will Smith. Mm -hmm. Why could that not have been an existing property? You know, um, because they made a big deal out of the revelation. Well, nobody knew who these characters were. Why do we care when they made this big presentation of who they actually are? Um, uh, but it's still a good movie, more or less. And then they, they did various things like uh, My Super Ex-Girlfriend. Right. Which had a couple of fun bits in it. But I, I always, I just, I look askance upon those things. Um, we did mention Mystery Men, uh, Chelsea, and Mystery Men, as, as as Keith was saying, Mystery Men is really great. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that there's a debate back and forth on whether or not Tim Burton was the actual director of that movie. There are people who argue both sides that the guy whose name is on it was the actual director, and there are people who swear that uh, Tim Burton directed it because it's very kind of Tim Burton-y vibed. Mm-hmm. And so I can see it. I don't buy it, but I can see it. Um, and I just I, love the the way they played with the superhero tropes in that movie of the, well, that can't be Mr. Amazing. He wears glasses. <laughs> How would he see? <laughs> yeah. And the, the, uh, the, the skull bowling ball. Yes. Still one of my favorite things. And I believe here is yeah. Keith. Hello. <gasps> I hate technology. <laughs> Even though I'm here because of technology. Yeah. yeah. And we're out of time, everybody. No, <laughs> we're really not. <laughs> look, look, it's it's our internet. We don't care. Yeah. Um, um, I, I want to quickly say that I agree with Gary. There's, there are no Crow sequels, although there actually were. And I sat through all four of them when I did. Um, <laughs> and what especially got me watching them was that, like, I, uh, there, there, there's, a radio, uh, there's a news radio station here in New York called WINS. Uh, where they, their motto is, if you give us 22 minutes, we'll give you the world. Mm. I discovered when I was in college that the problem with this is if you listen, if you give them 44 minutes, they give you the world twice. <laughs> um, and it, no one needs it, that. This is this is the, it, it, this is not a station that, that benefits long listening. Um, that was the problem watching the Crow movies. The Crow, all four Crow movies are the same freaking movie. You know, down to having four bad guys that he kills in sequence. You yeah. know, uh, that you know, and one at least one of them gets impaled. And you know, it's like it, it followed the same beats every single time, um, and and with a, with a different mediocre actor every single time. No. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, The Crow was one of those movies I loved when I first saw it in theaters and didn't like it any other time I watched it. 
Hmm. Yeah. Um, it, like when I first saw it, it was cool and nifty, and then after that, I was like, eh. I mean, Ernie Hudson was cool. I felt that I felt that way about the Spawn movie. Oh, got it. I walked out of the theater going, "Wow, that was really good." And then in retrospect, I go, "What was I doing? What was I thinking?" <laughs> um, uh, the, the, we did mention Mystery Men. Um, we did, yeah. And 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 you guys were talking about Hancock, um, which was cool. I did. Uh, Tony, I mentioned V for Vendetta, which I also wanted to mention as well. That was. What was especially interesting was the original comic book was written as a commentary on Margaret Thatcher. Mm -hmm. uh, and the movie that the Wachowskis put out was really a commentary on George W. Bush. Um, but it still worked. <laughs> yeah, it totally still worked. Yeah. And, 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 and it, it, there were some issues I had with the original comic, and particularly the way Evie was treated, that were addressed, at least, uh, in, in the movie. And also I discovered that I think my biggest problem with Hugo Weaving is... Um, his lack of facial expression because this is the first performance of his that I actually liked. Yeah. And it was the only time where I couldn't actually see his face. <laughs> and I'm wondering if that's, if that's related because I didn't like, you know, it's the same voice, you know, and it, yeah. it, it, he did such a wonderful job uh, as V. Well, they, um, uh, we, we, we sidetracked over to non superhero or non-adaptation superhero movies. Right. And yeah, I heard you guys talking. I had it on my phone running while I was okay. waiting for the computer to boot up. So I heard you mentioning Sky High, which is wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Isn't that the best? And and as I was saying, I feel like a gatekeeper about my superhero properties. <laughs> and whenever anyone does a superhero movie, I, I go, why didn't you just ad adapt this from something? Because then you have to pay somebody for the rights to it and they have approval over it. That is uh, true. Hmm. Um, whereas if you just do your own, you're not beholden to anybody. About it. Yeah. Yeah. But sky high could have been a Disney channel, regular series. Oh yeah. It well, was, I think that was the original plan. It was, it was sort of like a, if this does well, we'll do a show. Yeah. But uh, what I like though, yeah. about the superhero movie thing is that it has just normalized superheroes. Yeah. And every, Cause there have yeah. been, for example, Disney Channel superhero shows that my nieces and nephews absolutely love. And from there, they got into Star Wars and they got into the CW superhero shows. And I go, uh, yeah, I told you. Yeah, they're great. I told you. I, I want to also uh, mention one that people I don't think I don't know if they necessarily realize it was based on a comic book is the Kingsman movies. Yeah. Um, really? Yeah. Did I not know this? Yeah. Apparently not. Yeah. Yeah. That was, it was based on a Mark Millar. Uh, oh. Yeah. Comic book. yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think. Called Kings... the Secret Service. Yeah. Yeah. I think both the Kingsman movie and the Kick Ass movie both managed to pull off the feat of being better than the source material. Because mm. I did. In some ways. I was, yeah. Yeah. I was not a fan. Of, I mean, Kingsman was okay. It was definitely a James Bond pastiche. Oh, yeah. But Kick Ass, yeah. I got to the end of reading Kick Ass, or not Kick Ass, Wanted. Kick ass and wanted both. I wanted to throw both of those books like in a river when I got to the ending. The well, in the case of Kick Ass, um, the comic book wasn't actually finished when they started de developing the movie, oh. right? Um, and and um, uh, Matthew Vaughn uh, and and his screenwriter and his uh, screenwriting partner uh, Jane Goldman uh, came out had a different ending than than what mm -hmm. Millar and Romita Jr. Uh, came up with for the same story. <laughs> a vastly uh, different ending. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the, although there were there were some elements of the comic book that I thought were better. Also, mm -hmm. uh, in particular, the treatment of his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. um, I thought I thought his yeah. girlfriend's response to finding yeah. out he was a superhero in the comic book was a lot more realistic and and frankly just better generally. Um, You're not wrong. In the, in the movie, in the movie, the girlfriend was basically a prize for him to be won. Uh, yeah. In the comic book, she was an actual character with agency. Yeah. I thought that was better. Um, uh, we also I, didn't talk. Uh, we also didn't mention uh, Hellboy. Yes. Now, yeah. I ooh those those Hellboy movies. Well, the first two Hellboy movies. I, There's a third one. Yes, there is. <laughs> I, I did not know that, Gary. <laughs> the, um, the first two Hellboy. I movies. told you, I watched every single one of them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and, um, gosh, David Wright just mentioned Unbreakable. Um, as we were saying, not yeah. an adaptation, but no. and but maybe it's definitely a um, distillation. Yeah, 
I, and I think what, uh, what, as you were saying earlier, it, it came along too early because yeah. had it been in the middle of the superhero thing, people would have been like, ooh, wow. Well, it's not like it was a horribly unsuccessful movie either. No, um, no, no, no. It was. Yeah. It was. Um, and it was, I, I, Unbreakable is one of those movies that I really wish Shamalan had given to somebody else to direct. Mm. Um, that really needed a more kinetic director than, than he's ever been. Um, it was just too damn languid. Um, I would have loved to have seen like Robert Rodriguez or, or oh. somebody like that, you know, directing Unbreakable. And I think it the, just the, the, I, I guess because it was Shyamalan and because I'd been conditioned by all the previous Shyamalan movies. Well, it was only a second. <laughs> was it? Well, just maybe a third, but yeah. I was uh, maybe uh, maybe I saw Sixth Sense a lot, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was just uh, I was conditioned by by Sixth Sense to assume that everything is miserable and rainy and terrible, and that was not the point of Unbreakable. Unbreakable was a more or less upbeat sensibility, or, and well, yet everything was still rainy and miserable. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The, the 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 end result of Unbreakable wasn't everyone's dead and sad, right? <laughs> not in in that order, uh, but, but that was not the point of Unbreakable. I don't know. Um, what uh, what um, as 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 we we wrap up? What let's see if we can do this in a couple of minutes. What's wrong with the Fantastic Four in live action? Go. Okay, the the Fantastic Four's origin. Let me let me backtrack. One of the biggest problems with adapting a lot of Marvel's earliest heroes is that their origins are tied to a particular time and place. Yes. Um, the Fantastic Four and the Hulk are the worst examples of this. In the case of the Fantastic Four, is very specifically tied to the space race, mm -hmm. which was a thing in 1961 and stopped being one later. Um, and in the Hulk's case. The year after uh, the Hulk debuted, um, the above ground bomb testing was outlawed all around the world. <laughs> um, so, whenever you're doing those characters, you've got to come up with a different origin for them. Um, Iron Man's is like that too, but luckily there's always some war somewhere that Tony Stark could be. Yeah, it, it worked. Um, yeah. You know, it, it, it doesn't have to be Vietnam, it can be Afghanistan, it can be whatever. Yeah. Um, there's nothing like waking up to a bomb next to a bomb with literally your name on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Fantastic Four. The least interesting aspect of the Fantastic Four is their origin, and yeah, they keep focusing on it. Um, there's a reason why, in terms of just general story, Rise of the Silver Surfer was the strongest one out of the four, out of the four that had been done, because it wasn't tied into the origin. It was just telling a story. And that was the one where I felt most like I was watching a Fantastic Four movie because they were already a team. They were already set up. What's cool about them is a family of superheroes. Yeah. And, you know, the Incredibles understood that. You know, people have said, you know, the Incredibles is the best Fantastic Four movie ever made. Um, because they did, we didn't, it's just that the, the Incredible right. story had already happened. Exactly. The first and, and that's really, I hope when they bring the Fantastic Four into the MCU, that's the approach they take, is they just have them already be established. You can take care of their origin in like a, a five second news story in the background somewhere about how they, you know, flew into space or whatever. Yeah. I saw and someone right pitch, yeah. yeah, I saw someone pitch a wonderful idea of, the Fantastic Four start out in the 60s, in the space race, and whatever thing happens, they literally go through a warp and they pop out now. I, I've heard that mentioned as a theory yeah. and I've never liked it. I just... No. I, eh. then, 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 it be, then it's not a Fantastic Four story, it's a fish-out-of-water story. Mm. And okay. we already did that with Captain America. Yeah, True. yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's just repeating, you know, it's, 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 get a whole movie of, I get that reference. Um, <laughs> But it, it's it's possible. You know, the Incredibles proved that it's possible. And hell, Rise of the Silver Surfer, for all its flaws, and it had a lot, um, was that you could do at least a good Fantastic Four story. Of course, it helped that they were basically riffing on a story from 1968. Yeah. But um, that that one of my favorite stories related to the movie is that um, they would they would Peter David was going to write the novelization. He declined because they they wanted him to fly to California 
read over the script in a room and not let him actually have the script because they were worried about spoilers getting out <laughs> for this movie based on a comic book that came out in 1968. <laughs> the, the level of spoiler phobia both on the internet and in Hollywood is just depressing as hell to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. You'll ruin but, the movie. No one will go see it. No, trust me. We'll still go see it. Yeah. And that movie came pre-ruined. Um, yeah. <laughs> although it's funny, uh, you mentioned Hellboy, and in both the first Hellboy movie, and again in Rise of the Silver Surfer, you had Doug Jones playing with the characters, but somebody else providing the voice. Yeah. And what's fascinating to me is Doug Jones, Doug Jones has a great voice, and in fact, I liked his... Um, Oh, God, the Hellboy character. I'm, I'm blanking on his name. But, um, Abe Sapien. Abe Sapien, thank you. As good as um, um, David Hyde Pierce was as Abe Sapien, Doug Jones himself was actually a better one in the second movie. Yes. And as good as Lawrence Fishburne was, Doug Jones's voice is actually the voice I've always heard in my head when I've read The Silver Surfer going back to when I was a kid. Um, Doug Jones's voice is very much closer to what I imagine The Surfer sounding like. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he did, you know, with both... Abe Sapien, and, and especially the surfer, he did such a good job with body language. It's one of Jones's strengths. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, and and I would love to see him doing the Silver Surfer again. For that matter, I'd love to see, I mean, we'll, there's no way we'll get Chris Evans playing the Human Torch anymore. Um, but I really hope that since we've already established with um, J.K. Simmons showing up at the end of Far From Home as J. Jonah Jameson, that they're willing to bring cast members over from other incarnations of the character. Right. Yeah, yeah. Which means Michael Chiklis can play the thing again. Yes, thank you. Which yeah, he was needs born to happen for that because role. the best thing about the two the mid two thousands FF films were Michael Chiklis and Chris Evans. They were perfect, indeed. Um, and I remember Michael Chiklis in an interview being so into playing Ben Grimm. Yeah, he's a total freaking nerd. Chiklis. Yeah, and mm -hmm. he, said, he, he said to uh, Ian Griffith. Ian Griffith. Uh, thank you. Uh, he said to him. Uh, he, he in an interview he said, "Well, when we all got together to film, I said, I hope you guys don't mind being a family for the next twenty years." And that didn't happen, sadly, yeah. Yeah. Um, because it could have, I, yep. I guess, um, just like the cast of the Avengers that could have been the FF. Yeah, and and but I'm I, I think Chiklis needs another shot. Yes. Um. And and yeah. But it, and it, now it, maybe they can just motion capture him, and they don't have to put him in the in the thing suit, which we'll see. I don't know. But anyway, we've gone. We we could go on, and we will eventually go. We'll, we'll hit this again. We'll do this topic again. Um, there's 16 more hours of this kind of thing to talk about, and we'll do it on the American Sci-Fi Classics track with. Everybody you see here, and probably uh, we we got people in the wings. We, we, we've the, this is the topic we're going to keep coming back to because I could talk again about just the soundtrack of The Shadow, <laughs> just Taylor Dane. I'm just going to talk about Taylor Dane for an hour. That's okay, right? Absolutely, uh, it's your track. Do what you so, want. Yeah. So Keith, where can people find you, and where can they read more of your uh, t thoughts on superheroes? Uh to answer the second question first, you can, um, if you go to Tor.com and uh, search for the Great Superhero Movie Rewatch, uh, the official title is Four Color to 35 Millimeter, uh, the Great Superhero Movie Rewatch. So if you search for that title in any form, uh, you'll find it. Um, just searching for me on Tor.com won't do it because I've written so much stuff for them over the last nine years. <laughs> um, so so search, search for Superhero Movie Rewatch and you will find that column. Um, it, like I said, I, I spent two and a half years, uh, yeah, two and a half years uh, covering everything from Superman and the Mole Men all the way through to uh, Bloodshot and uh, Birds of Prey and Joker, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and everything in between. And it's all it's all in little groups, in appropriate groups. Um, and and I, I I covered a few things that don't necessarily count as superheroes. I stretched the definition. Like I included Flash Gordon. I included. Um, uh, Valerian in the City of a Thousand Planets, which, oh my god. Um, yeah. uh, which is too bad. It was a beautiful movie, but it was just... Oof. Um, and and so you can find me there as well as other stuff. Uh, I also... Uh, you can find me online at decantido.net, which is a spectacularly primitive website that's in the process of being upgraded, uh, but it links to all the places you can find me online. You can find me on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, 
uh, my Wikipedia page, uh, link to my stuff on tour. All of that is at decandido.net. Uh, and they're ordering links for uh, my most recent books. And just you can find me on whatever your book dealer of choice is. Search for my name um, and you will find my stuff in, in various licensed universes, in my own original universes. Um, I've got a book out recently called uh, To Hell and Regroup that I wrote with David Sherman, uh, which is a military science fiction novel. Uh, I've got stories in the anthologies uh, Badass Moms, uh, Pangea Book 3, Redemption. Um, and I've got a graphic novel out uh, called Icarus, which I wrote. Uh, it's an adaptation of Gregory A. Wilson's novel of the same name. Sweet. Um, and some other stuff, too. Uh, lot, lots of stuff coming out in 2021 as well. Um, and you can find... And you can also, assuming Dragon Con happens uh, for realsies next year, uh, I will be there, and I'm sure I'll be spending a ridiculous amount of time in the American Sci-Fi Classic. <laughs> yeah. That's how I roll. Exactly. We, we, and I'm sure we're doing more quarantine panels, too, so... Oh yes. Oh yeah. yeah. We we have dibs. <laughs> no, we uh, no we we're 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 stuck in this internet together. Um, yes. So Gary, where can people find you? Here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with you and him. <laughs> uh, you can find me on the Twitter here. Uh, you can find me on our Facebook page, which if you're watching this, you probably already have found. Hopefully. Um, and that's pretty much everywhere I'm at right now online. Oh, I forgot to mention something that oh, I oh. should mention. Um, just because I'm I'm greedy. Um, I also have a Patreon. Oh, uh, yeah, I forgot to mention. Yeah. Uh, and, a this channel, and money and a YouTube channel. Um, uh, Patreon.com/slash Crad. My initials K R A D. Um, I do TV reviews, movie reviews, excerpts from my works in progress, uh, vignettes featuring my original characters, uh, looks at first drafts of my fiction, and best of all, cat pictures. Cat pictures. Yes. Yeah. And the, then, the, the reason and, the internet was invented. Exactly. And the cat picture tier is only like $2 a month. So it's not. <laughs> um, and, and I also have a YouTube channel where I've been reading my short fiction. Uh, mm -hmm. It's called Crad COVID Readings, which is which was actually what, uh, when I commented on uh, on YouTube while I was waiting for my computer to sign back up, that's that's what I, it came as. Yeah. If you go to that channel, the Crad COVID Readings, that has me, I've got over 80 episodes of uh, me reading my short fiction. So check that out. Yeah, Give this man money. Yes, please. Yes. yes, the cats need food. Definitely, they like always taking pictures of them. And 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 right now they need it. Right now. Well, not right now because if they did, they'd be like crawling all over me right now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. True. 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 So, um, but guys, thank you very much for spending time away from uh, in the real world. Uh, <laughs> and thank you for hanging out with us for a little while. We'll be back tomorrow night for some good fun with um, a, an Ask Me Anything about Gary. Tomorrow night, we are celebrating the birthday of Mr. Gary Mitchell, and we have collected a, a bunch of questions that we're going to ask Mr. Gary Mitchell, and he doesn't know what we're going to ask him, and it's going to be delightful. And I'm sure uh, he won't know even after we ask them. Nope. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but, oh, thank you, Tony. But fi find us here on the YouTube and on Facebook. We're at facebook.com slash groups slash American Sci-Fi Classics. We do this stuff all the time. We ain't stopping. And um, we will see you tomorrow night when Gary Mitchell says, I'm still not wearing pants. <laughs>